Thank you, everybody, for joining us here for this session, Focus on Make Data Count. Um, we are going to be talking about data evaluation. I'm very pleased to be here to share some of the activities that Make Data Count has been leading, but also what we have in store for the coming months and the coming years. Um, I'll be presenting from the Make Data Count perspective in the first part. And then I'm pleased to have here also our guest speaker, Mark Hannell, who is VP of Open Research as Digital Science. Although I'm sure that you may, some of you may be familiar with him from his very important role as founder of Pixia. Um, we still have uh, some time after the presentations uh, to have some Q&A, but of course, if you have any questions or comments at any point, please do share them. There is the dedicated Q&A uh, section for questions. So, we look forward to coming to those after the presentations. Okay, so with that, um, I'll give you a bit of an overview about Make Data Count and what we've been working on. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the initiative, but just in case, very briefly, we are a community initiative that seeks to catalyze the development of responsible data metrics. Essentially, what we want to do is put in place the building blocks that will enable the community more broadly um, to evaluate the reach and impact of open data and to recognize uh, that reach and impact and do so responsibly. We work in a number of areas, developing infrastructure. This is where data site is a key player in the Make Data Count initiative and has been so for a number of years. Um, so we work on developing tools that hopefully help us uh, collect, store and share measures of data usage, um, uh, hopefully at, at, in as large a scale and as easily as we can. But importantly, we have a community focus. We uh, engage and convene community members to have discussions as to what are the standards, the practices, the guidance, resources that we may need to bring the community along in adopting uh, responsible uh, practices to, again, de develop this common knowledge of how uh, data is uh, being used for uh, the benefit of research and society. We fit really into this common uh, uh, need and common questions in our, among the community members about how data is being used. We all want to understand what's happening. We are putting a lot of effort on, on sharing data and doing so responsibly according to our principles, uh, interconnecting that in the ecosystem. So. We want to understand what was the return on investment and what's happening with those data sets. What, what are they uh, uh, feeding into in terms of research and policy activities? And this is really about responding to needs. We have this uh, need of understanding how data translate into those benefits. To get us to the point of uh, getting the collective understanding and start addressing these questions that we have, we need meaningful data metrics. So we start building this picture on the usage of uh, data. I've mentioned data metrics several times, and I thought I would spend a few moments uh, describing what we mean by this. Uh, when we talk about data metrics, we mean uh, meaningful and contextualized measures of how data is accessed or utilized. And we see three key pieces that fit into this meaningful data metrics uh, environment. The first is that we are collecting quantitative information as to how data sets are being used. This may come in the form of uh, data citations, the counts of views and downloads, other ways of uh, interactions with data sets that are developing, et cetera. We will need to find the ways to uh, collect some quantitative measures around us. Quantitative measures, however, are not the only piece of the puzzle that fits into this. There may also be qualitative information that we can collect or generate about the impact, the reach of those data sets. For there are a number of uh, institutions, for example, that they are now looking as part of their evaluation processes to have some narrative summaries, annotated summaries as to how different research outputs, including data sets, are uh, advancing research projects, what's the impact that they provide, et cetera. So that's also useful information. And importantly, we also need the third element of context. Essentially, in order for quantitative and qualitative measures to be meaningful and fit into data metrics, they need to be contextualized so that they can be used even if they have been collected uh, by different groups, different platforms, 
and so that the users who are going to be utilizing that information on usage know that they can trust how this counts or this information has been generated and that it is comparable across, um, again, the source of the information. So essentially, we see data metrics as sitting uh, on top of these three key pieces, and we need to work on all of them to make those data metrics meaningful and responsible. We have been doing a, a quite a bit of work over the years as part of the Make Data Count Initiative, supporting, again, the different pieces that will fit into these tools to collect quantitative information, what are the practices that fit into that and qualitative information as well as the standards, but we feel that really the time is now to start putting some focus into this element of data evaluation. We have seen great progress in, in data sharing and best practices towards that, but we believe that the priority should move now as part of responsible data stewardship to also start looking at what happens. What's the, how do we evaluate data? What are the tools and the frameworks that we can put in place to make sure that that happens? Uh, and that it brings also the incentives and the reward for the data producer that we, we want to bring along. So I invite you to, to read this paper that we published actually um, fitting into conversations that we had with the community last year, where we made that call to action to really start routinely evaluating data as part of research and policy development activities. And one of the things that uh, of the ways in which we convened these conversations with the community was the Make Data Count Summit. This is an event that we uh, started last year. We had a, uh, an event in Washington, D.C., um, which provided a lot of energy and a number of conversations where there have been progress, where there was complexity and nuances that we needed to tackle together. And it was, it, I think to me, one of the things that it, it surfaced was that we needed to have more of these conversations in dedicated forums, um, focused specifically on data metrics and data evaluation. We know that there are many communities and events that uh, look at open data more broadly, um, but we felt that sometimes this uh, conversation about how do we evaluate data can be diluted if we put it in the bigger, uh, sea of conversations about open data. So we felt that this was a valuable uh, convening to have, and that we also wanted to bring those conversations to uh, different groups and communities that perhaps couldn't attend the summit last year. So we actually, yes, earlier this month, we hosted a second summit in London, bringing together representatives uh, from research institutions, funders, government, researchers themselves, publishers, infrastructure providers, etc., all to convene again to have these narrowly focused conversations specifically on how can we advance responsible evaluation of uh, open data. We ask, uh, it was an event that we ran over two days and we ask attendees essentially to keep this uh, couple of questions that I posted there for you as well in mind as part of the different uh, panel discussions, breakout discussions that we had. Essentially, what are the practices, policies, and tools that we need to really support responsible data metrics? And how can we actually embed this evaluation and reward for uh, the impact of, of data as part of our common practices? Um, independent of where, what is our expertise or the perspective and professional setting that we are in, how can we really advance those practices in our own uh, organizations and communities? We have posted a summary from the discussions at the summit, and we, I invite you to, to have a look. But what I wanted to do as part of this session is to dive a little bit more uh, into some priorities that we identified as part of the conversations that we had with the attendees. Uh, at the summit and also to tie that to some of the activities that make data count is already working on or already has in the pipeline also uh, informed by the conversations at this event. So a couple of the things that came up in the conversations uh, related to priorities was an interest in supporting existing infrastructure and ongoing initiatives, essentially recognizing that there is already progress and work being done in this space and see how we can find synergies that, so that we can build on each other and amplify, amplify each other's uh, work. 
Um, and also a lot of interest about surfacing more data article connections. So you know, in, in some context, we call this data citations, which I was very happy to hear because obviously make data count is very engaged in increasing the number of uh, those connections that we can make available to the community. So it was interesting to hear because obviously make data count is already uh, uh, working on our project to develop the data citation corpus. Many of you have probably heard me speak about this project since last year when we started. But I, just as a brief overview, what this project aims to achieve is to create a large open aggregate of data citations. So this data to paper connections that were discussed in the summit. And the idea is to bring together these citations, these data to paper links uh, from a diversity of sources, knowing that some of them are generated through the OI metadata, for example, and repositories are doing fast fantastic job uh, identifying these connections to, between data sets and publications and including that in metadata. But we also know that other groups in the community have an interest in this. They may be, be doing manual curation and their own exploration of articles to find this. But we also now have tools that perhaps were not as developed a few years ago through machine learning, for example, to try to, to identify these connections. And in fact, the, the current file of the data citation corpus includes 5 million data citations that originate from DOI metadata, but also this data to paper links identified through machine learning. This was thanks to a collaboration with Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, who uh, uh, developed an algorithm to mine the full text of articles and identify mentions to data sets uh, based on the DOI or the accession number. So the corpus is bringing together for the first time citations to data sets with DOIs and accession numbers. Um, we released the uh, first data file for the corpus earlier this year, and actually we released a new version just a few weeks ago that incorporates some additional um, citations, but importantly, quite a, a bit of um, a cleanup and improvements and enhancements that we did on the record. So I invite you to um, uh, explore the file and provide feedback on that. And again, this is one of the a project that fit into a broader ecosystem of uh, different groups that are already looking at this data uh, article uh, mentions. And we have plans, obviously, and we're already in conversations with many others in this space so that we can hopefully collaborate and enhance the coverage of the data citation corpus. But something else I wanted to mention briefly is that before the summit, we also hosted a hackathon that was actually focused on the, on the data file for the data citation corpus, we had five uh, teams across two locations in London and, and Oakland in California, um, exploring different aspects of the data file for the corpus. Uh, some of them decided to look at aspects related to perhaps curation and uh, how to do some cleanup or investigation of uh, specific metadata fields for the data citation records. A couple of others uh, work on visualizations um, of the content of the corpus or so one of them. And so in here, I have no credit uh, for, for this beautiful graph. Um, I invite you to go to the GitHub repository where the teams documented their work and you have links to, to not only this, but some other visualizations that they did exploring Again, the distribution of citations according to subject area, journal, publisher, and others. But I know that Mark is also going to be presenting on a very nice exploration of aspects of the, of the corpus. So I, I'll let him uh, go in more detail about that. Coming back to the priorities that were uh, surfaced in the discussions that we had on the uh, summit, Something else that came up was the fact that there are a number of areas that we need to work on with different stakeholders and community members um, to really uh, explore the nuances that we need to tackle uh, and develop guidance or tools or resources that can help in particular institutions and researchers uh, drive forward and adopt uh, data metrics. And this was something that was quite interesting to us because we had already identified institutions as a key player in supporting implementation of uh, data metrics. Obviously, institutions work very closely with their researchers, providing support and training, but they also have their own evaluation processes. 
Um, so they intersect at different stages, and they also have a lot of leverage through the, again, in recognizing open data through the hiring, tenure, and promotion uh, processes. And in fact, this is one of the areas that we discussed in the summit that we did last year uh, with a number of summit attendees, we, we work on developing what we thought would be an initial potential uh, uh, guide uh, on things that institutions could think about if they wanted to incorporate uh, open data. And in this case, we also included uh, software contributions as part of the hiring, tenure, and promotion processes. So we uh, published uh, 10 simple rules paper, recognizing that these are not simple things and that they are not necessarily rules, but at least as a food for thought for any institutional representatives thinking about that. Um, it was a topic that came back several times during the summit, and we think that this is an area that will require some community uh, effort, and we will be seeking, again, to catalyze, hopefully, a working group to uh, explore some of the topics that we have in the 10 Simple Rules paper a bit more, but also develop more tailored and uh, uh, guidance and resources for specifically for institutions that want to implement data metrics. And the third uh, bucket of priorities that came up through the uh, discussions at the summit, all in relation to advancing data metrics, was the potential value of having uh, a catalog of resources around policies, guidance, again, for implementation, perhaps events in this space where this conversation happening. For those who may be new to this conversation and maybe also for those who have been um, involved but want to keep up to date with the latest um, the latest developments. And something else that also came up was the value of encouraging and fostering global collaborations. So we can include the diversity of groups in these conversations, again, regarding the sector where they may be working on, but also the uh, regions where they may be based. We had a very diverse group of attendees at the summit this year in London. And I think that was one of the, the key uh, rich elements of the discussion, having this perspective from wh where these different communities are in their in their conversations um, around uh, policies and infrastructure for for data metrics. So, in relation to this, uh, I'm happy to say that actually we were already working behind the scenes on making some improvements to the Make Data Account website, and this is my opportunity. Uh, to share with you that we just unveiled our new design yesterday, so I encourage you to have a look, please. I hope uh, you will um, like it. And if you find anything that is missing or you would like to see added, please let us know. Uh, but in particular, I'm quite excited to share that one of the specific sections that we wanted to include in this updated website was a dedicated resources section. Here, we're going to be including resources, not only from Make Data Count, but from others that may be uh, arising from community discussions and groups, as well as research evidence that relates to this. Um, I, I mentioned at the beginning that for data metrics to be meaningful, they need to be contextualized. And we very much believe in doing research on data practices and data usage practices to help us uh, again, build those that understanding of what are the next areas that we need information on to bring the context that is relevant for evaluation. Uh, so again, I invite you to, to also visit that section of the website. And related to collaboration, this, I mean, Make Data Account has also always seen itself as a hub of collaboration. Um, so I wanted to give uh, 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 a few pointers as to how you can participate and contribute. Um, as I mentioned, please do share resources that we are happy to amplify those on our website, but we are also very happy to support you in your data metrics and data evaluations journey. We are happy to amplify the work that you do, any success stories that you may have, any challenges and lessons learned um, that you may have identified through your own work. Um, as I mentioned, we have the data citation corpus data file out there. This is a project that is still ongoing. It will be iterative in nature, and we are very happy to have, again, either input or feedback on what's there now and how useful it is for you and what you would like to see in it to make it even more useful. Um, and also a reminder that we are engaged with other groups in the community and are always open to um, uh, having additional channels of communication to, with other existing groups. We participate actively in a number of RDA 
uh, groups, for example, Fossil 11 initiatives and many others. So if you have an idea and you would like to collaborate, please do get in touch. We are always very happy uh, to work together. And with that, just a reminder, again, do visit the website. I'm quite excited to be able to, to share the new design. Uh, do have a look. Uh, a couple of other ways of always keeping up to date with our activities are our newsletter, our mailing list. If you haven't joined, please do so. Uh, that's the best place to, to hear the latest in what's brewing for data metrics. And we post our resources on the Sinaloa community. These slides will also be available there. But with that, I'm going to be um, uh, handing over to our guest speaker for today. So Mark Hanna, as I mentioned, VP of Open Research from Digital Science, um, who I know has already been playing with the corpus as well. So he's going to be sharing more about their work with data more broadly and, and data citations. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Aracha. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, th this is a very exciting time for data. Um, as Iracha mentioned, I will be digging into the data citation corpus uh, and I'll be talking about why I think it's important. I have tons more data that I won't be showing, but um, all of you can go and get your hands on the corpus and play with it yourself. Um, as with all things, it's new and um, many eyes make all bugs shallow so we can we can build on it together but i think what's really important right now is this idea of uh, emerging priorities and practical steps because as i said just a second ago it's a very exciting time for data for many reasons um and one of them is you know this thing called ai has come along and started eating all of the data repositories and there are problems, but I think we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. And we should focus on what the great things are that are happening. And even if you have some qualms with it, even if you're like, well, that's not a perfect situation. Um, Google owns DeepMind. That's not perfect. Um, we, we should focus on uh, what the priorities are and how we can uh, play the game with what we have. And I think... Um, Seeing where we are with what people are saying around data and what people are actually doing with data is a wonderful position to be on. Uh, I think the concept of um, what I just mentioned with DeepMind, um, as I mentioned, as I, I, you know, the idea that we should have more open algorithms, we should have transparency around what is happening by commercial companies around AI. But the the long and short of it with um, AlphaFold is to recreate what the data that they have made openly available um, from 200,000 protein folding structures to 20 million. I did the maths, it would cost $20 trillion. I had to Google what that number is. And I don't think the fact that they're gonna commercialize that should take away from the fact that we have all of this wonderful data and there's many of an opportunity to build on top of the data that we have. There's other aspects that I'll get into in a minute uh, about where we're seeing a little bit of resistance now with the open research, open data movement and why that's important. But um, we know that we need to make data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable for humans and for machines. The human side to it is much easier than the machine side of it, uh, particularly in the world of generalist repositories versus subject specific repositories. So my personal opinion as somebody who's ran a generalist repository is we have a big gap between subject specific repositories with really great custom metadata and um, generalist repositories. And we need to fill that gap with thematic repositories. We need to uh, have better metadata around the data that's being shared. The National Institute of Health have the Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative, uh, which is building a fantastic base layer of interoperability between these repositories. So again, we could do better, there's more to be done, but at the same time, there's fantastic things happening in the space. So I'm gonna to touch on two things. One is what is happening now uh, with what researchers are saying around open data, and then dig into some of the uh, new data on 
what we can see uh, researchers are doing when it comes to data. So for those who don't know, we uh, run the State of Open Data survey every year with Spring in Nature. It's been going for eight years, nine years. Uh, this year, we've got a new one coming out in October, over 30,000 respondents, uh, which is probably more like 35,000 respondents now. And in 2023, we had our first partner publication with, from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, which is the data is all made openly available. You can go and crunch it. And I think year on year, we've seen, you know, it's all great that globally 1% more of researchers know what FAIR is, but we can now start looking at the data to split it up and say, okay, what's happening in different territories with different funders? What's working? What's not working? Um, and we know the generic things. If you look back over the last five years, um, credit is an ongoing issue. So do you think you get enough credit for sharing your data? So um, five years ago, 60% said no. This year, 60% said no. So what is happening to better address that situation with researchers in order to give you credit for your research? So one thing we thought of Figshare, so um, Figshare has figshare.com, which is a free repository and it, it provides repositories for uh, repository infrastructure as well for funders, publishers, institutions. Um, and we've seen we were in a very lucky position that we have a sister organization called Dimensions that has full text access to all of the 100 million articles. So we can look at it and say, how many times does this DOI from Figshare pop up in those um, articles? And we see that software gets cited more than anything else per unit. Data sets come next in the non-traditional research outputs uh, world. But we also see that it's very few and far that you get 200 citations for a data set that you would see for publications. And a lot of a citation is just, I have made my data available, you can find it here. So a lot of data sets have one citation. If you look at to look at Dryad, which requires you to link it to a paper, then all of them would have at least one, right? So this is good in the sense that we can start quantifying it, but it's not great in the sense of, moving the needle on um, funders starting to reward researchers for making their data available based on citations, because they'd have to use Figshare um, and you wouldn't have compared apples to apples across uh, different repositories, let alone subject specific repositories and generalist repositories. We also find that support is not making the way to those who need it. So in terms of priorities, um, so many people, almost three quarters of respondents have never received support, support with making their data openly available. Um, so where do they turn to? Who do they turn to? We see the library is important. We see people turning to publishers because that's the point at which they have to make their paper available. It's often the first time they've thought about their data. If PLOS say you have to make your data available, they're like, oh, I better go and find my data. If Nature say you have to make your data available, you know they're going to find their data and make sure that that data is available. So um, what areas of any do you feel that you need help with in regard to making your research data openly available? We're seeing things that you'd expect, you know, uh, finding the time. I had there's, there's more and more things I need to do as a researcher that, to add another burden of making my data openly available, which does take time. Um, that's becoming more of a concern. The thing around licensing though, again, this through the eight years, researchers don't know what license to make their data available under. We keep it super simple with Figshare. You only have CCBY or CC0, but um, this is a concern. And this is in terms of priorities, we need to start addressing this and think about how do we make sure that all researchers everywhere are getting this training? And when we look at this from a global perspective, we know that one size does not fit all. When I said that um, the data is openly available, anyone can go and look at it. This was some work I did earlier in the year with uh, three undergrads from um, King's College London. So, you know, undergrads can run with this data and find some really interesting stuff, uh, which I'm sure you could if you wanted to see it too. So thinking about the country in which you are currently working, how supportive are, are you of the idea of a national mandate? For making research data openly available. 
And this is interesting because we've always looked at the state of open data year on year and seeing what's the global trend. The global trend doesn't account for what's happening at the national level, at the institutional level, We're depending on the subject and what uh, journals you're publishing in. So there's many ways in which you can slice this, and I think it's really important to do so. Um, and it's very important on both sides, what people say they're doing and what people are actually doing. So in what people are saying they believe in, uh, we see Ethiopia, India, Germany, um, very strong support when compared to, say, uh, Japan, China, Italy. And if you look at just focusing in on the opposite ends of that spectrum in Ethiopia and Japan and somewhere in the middle with the United States, how supportive would you be of a national mandate for making research data openly available? It's interesting in that um, the differences between the countries still exist, but in the last couple of years, we've started to see a downtrend. And I think this is to do with the fact that a lot of researchers are in theory in favor of opening all the things and building on top of what's gone beforehand. But again, the the funder mandates are coming in and the, um, we're, the rubber is hitting the road here on terms of we need to actively find time to do this. I'm less keen to be as open as I was before because it's real life work for me when I don't have the time to do it. Which one of these circumstances would motivate you the most to share your data? Uh, it's interesting in that you see in Japan, again, using the same three countries, citation of my research papers is very uh, important, 34%, and the United States was only 10%, whereas in the United States, the funder requirement, 7.84% versus 0.66%. It's interesting, but citation is still number one in all of these countries. Um, if you look at this side by side, it's hard to see. I'll sh uh, these sh slides have been shared on Tenodo, so you can go and get them. But um, the funder mandate is on the left, and the citation um, of my research is on the right. And you can see that although the United States had the lowest one, it's still year on year is growing as every other country as well. So. I need to have citations for my research. I need to um, track this. How familiar are you with the FAIR data principles in relation to open data? Again, Ethiopia is going up using the same three countries. All open data, all done by undergrads. Um, United States is growing up. Japan has stayed consistent. So again, we can see when we're talking about priorities around research data, it's not a one, um, one size fits all. There are different nuances within your country, within your ways of training, and I'm sure there are differences in the funder and the journal and the subject you're working in. And I think that we're at the point now where we need to be addressing this conversation. So what could be happening? Ethiopia has a government mandate, so does the USA. Japan and Asia in general seem a lot more concerned with IP. If you read the Chinese Academy of Sciences paper uh, on um, research data, there's a big focus on IP. Why is this? We can dig into it. And different countries are educating researchers at different levels. How can we join up and be consistent? So I only have a few minutes left, uh, bear with me. But this is when we start looking at the corpus that Iracha mentioned. So if we look at the percentage of papers from a particular country that have a link to a data set in the uh, data site sees uh, Chan Zuckerberg corpus by country, good news is it's all up and to the right. There is more data being linked from papers than um, there has been at the turn of the millennium. What you'll do see, you remember India, um, they said they were very keen on making data openly available, um, but they're not necessarily doing so when compared to other countries. Again, Botswana, Ethiopia are doing very well. Um, and, and so we're seeing that there's differences at the country level. We also, as I mentioned, have the, uh, this data in dimensions. Um, what's interesting here is the corpus that Iraq was talking about has all of the data site DOIs, but all, it also has accession numbers. And this is a, a tease between DOIs from data site. There's a lot of generalist repositories 
accession numbers tend to be subject specific repositories. So you can start looking as well and seeing the differences there. The thing we see, uh, this is a much uh, shortened time scale, so it's all up and to the right as well here. Um, but the percentage of papers citing a data set in the dimensions corpus, which is basically data site DOIs, you see a slight difference in the ordering here. It's all up and to the right, but you see a difference. And if we look at, I've pulled up Germany or Japan, um, in Germany, you see the dotted line is the average across all of these uh, countries in how well they're doing with making the linking to a data set from a paper. And at the top, you have the CZI data site corpus. At the bottom, you have dimensions. So this is, what I will say here is this is, uh, it's not, neither data set is perfect. It's a new corpus for us to look at. There's lots of work to be done in cleaning up the data. But the fact that the trends are similar suggests that we can rely on the fact that the linking from data papers to data sets is going up. If you look at the top here in the top two graphs, it's saying generalist repositories and subject specific repositories. And you see that Germany is just above, whereas in just the um, DOIs from the data site um, generalist repositories, you see Germany is doing much better compared to the average. So you can say that we can infer here, again, it's a leap, that um, Germany is doing well in encouraging people to put people in subject specific, put data in subject specific repositories, but they're really doing well as well at saying, if you have data, make it openly available in a subject, in a generalist repository, if you have it. Whereas Japan is under on the um, average against the subject specific and generalist repositories and way down on just the generalist repositories. So it could be something in the way that the messages are going out. Uh, as I say, we have a lot more data on a lot more countries, and I can show you more explicit ones uh, than this, where they're doing very well on accession numbers and less well on generalist repositories. So every country is looking at it from a different point of view. And we can slice this in many different ways. We can look at funders, we can look at FOR codes, we can look at institutions. Again, if you want that data, I have it, I can share it with you. I can give you one of these graphs, but you can start to see as well what's working. In 2005, the Wellcome Trust updated their open access policy. It doesn't explicitly mention open data. Um, it doesn't mandate open data, but you can see between 2005 and 2010, something went very right. The same with the National Cancer Institute, I saw a question that mentioned uh, the S index before. Again, I'm showing you data that's not perfect. Uh, I don't love indexes, but I love the idea that we now have data sets that can be con that can, we can compare apples to apples across all repositories, across data that lives anywhere because of the CZI data site corpus. Um, so we can create algorithms and indexes that are consistent. Obviously, you will want differences between um, the different subject areas because different areas use data in different ways, but this is what they're uh, giving a million dollar prize away for. So uh, I'm very happy to see this happening. Is it, I'm sure the outcome that we get won't be perfect as we all think of it as people who are very deeply entrenched in this space, but it will move the needle. And that's what's very important here. So you can see now we have transparency around what is happening with linking to data sets. Why can we not um, have the Australian Research Council doing as well as the Wellcome Trust? What are the things we can do to encourage? What are the priorities that the Wellcome Trust is doing since 2005 that are different to Australian Research Council? I don't mean to call out names. I'm just uh, using it as an example. And when I mentioned before that uh, the rubber has, is hitting the road and there's a little bit more reticence when it comes to researchers who have extra work to do, we also have to think about the macroeconomic climate and the fact that uh, the one on the right, Congress could stop free public access to government-funded research. Um, 
in July 2023, the US House Appropriations Subcommittee on Commerce, la la la, uh, prohibits, they had a bill put forward that would prohibit federal resources from implementing the Nelson memo, which uh, was all around open research and open data. And it got quashed, fantastic. But now there's another one coming up. This is from August, 2024, um, the open access mandate. And so while, to bring us back to the beginning, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. We can get caught up in the idea that there's not everything is going perfectly. If these things happen, we will need to evolve the way in which we work. Um, we should focus on what data needs to be shared and not all data needs to be shared. So let's focus on the good data that we have and training is inconsistent. Policies alone have less impact We've seen differences in different countries, as I mentioned. Um, not every policy from the government of different countries is working in the same way. But what I will say to finish off on something massively positive is now we have the information. Now we have the transparency. Here is the number of NIH funded papers with a link to a data set. Not only is this data set fantastic and it's up and to the right, but um, in 2023, which is the next column, is when the NIH implemented their policy that all data needs to be open, made openly available if they're funding it at the point at which you publish your publication. This is fantastic because then if we do see some pullback from, in this case, uh, federally funded research in North America, we have the data to say, look at the impact that's had, look at why that hasn't been beneficial to this graph, and in the long haul, uh, $20 trillion has been saved by DeepMind looking at PDB, the protein data bank, this openly available research data. America already knows this with the Human Genome Project. So now we have both the ways in which we can encourage researchers to make their op data openly available and the ways in which we can track and hold people accountable, which we haven't had the ability to do so before in an Apple's, uh, compared to Apple's way. So that's everything for me. Happy to share any more of this data with anybody else who wants to see it and happy to answer questions now. Thank you so much, Mark. Fascinating to look at. Thank you for sharing that analysis. I found it super interesting. Um, yes, uh, happy to we we'll have a bit of time for questions. So if you have any, please do add them to the q and I did have some questions for you, but I'm not going to like <laughs> step into my prerogative just yet. Um, uh, because I saw there is a question in the Q and A uh, about the uh, data sharing index challenge that I think you, you just referenced as well, uh, Mark. Um, interesting, and thank you for for sharing this. Um, it's uh, a competition that we are watching, obviously. In I think it'd be I'd be curious to see what comes out of this challenge. Um, the important thing from my perspective is um, to make sure that whenever we collect information about how data is being shared and used, as I mentioned at the very beginning with my diagrams, is that what we are looking for is as much context and as much information as possible and ways of uh, contextualizing that. So I think that the important thing from my perspective is having metrics in plural, so different types of metrics that will be useful for different users and to have them in comparable ways as also Mark was referring to. Like how, how can we pull the information together in a way that makes them comparable and usable for, by different users? So we are watching this. Um, and I think that, again, the other thing I will highlight about this uh, challenge is the fact that NIH obviously cares a lot about open data. And it's interesting that they are also paying attention to understanding how data is being used is something that they also have a focus on as part of the great initiative where fiction and, and data, uh, data site are also participants. So something to watch. Okay, I saw a couple of uh, questions coming up. So let's see, uh, the question from Julie. Um, have you seen any evidence if the new focus on AI and opening research up to new models, so it's moving while I read, so not doing a very good reading job, uh, of scraping what's uh, shown online is playing a factor into researchers' return to hesitancy to open data and data sharing. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I don't have any evidence uh, myself, although I know that anecdotally, 
in different um, at least conferences and events that I have participated in. This is something that has come up, which I always find very interesting because I'm a supporter of open licenses. So, I mean, this was one of the uses that was potentially possible. Um, but as with many things, I think the important thing is having the right frameworks and often developing the framework re is reactive to a particular new use that comes up. Um, but important that we keep talking about this, but I don't know, Mark, if you wanted to add to this, if this is something that has come up in, in your groups. Yeah, I think, I think this comes down to the whole, I'm excited about where we are. And I think that, I think the S index is a great example of this, that we can't let short term gains screw us over right we can't um my own personal opinion you know it's it's if you if you set up things for solve for this people will solve for this in ways that you don't anticipate and we see this with gold open access right uh solve for two thousand dollars an article people will make sure that there's great articles that come out in that they are sound science but they might have already been you know, they're invited publications and they don't necessarily need to be published in a different way again. And so we've gone from 2 million articles a year in, in the year uh, 2010 to uh, 7 million articles a year last year. But at the same time, we've gone in 2017, we went past 50% of all articles are open access at the point of publication. So it's kind of like we have solved that problem of gold open access, but we've unleashed many more problems and this is with the uh, i think thankfully it's the it's the nci who's doing this that with the s index we can think about this in a conversation of can we solve for x which is allow people to make their data more openly available in order to you know get more bang for your buck as a, as a funder it, you know it's insane that if you've paid for the research the data sets don't get openly made openly available right now but because of the uh, societal stuff that we have in academia we need to encourage people to do this and so if you can encourage if you can solve for x where you say be transparent about what the algorithm is be transparent about um how we're ranking people so people don't just reverse engineer these weird you know citation rings again for data sets that's great and i think the same thing is true of um where we are with ai the problem with AI is it, it's it's going, the problem and the great thing about it is it's it's moving so fast. You know, it's moving at an exponential scale. So uh, if I was one of the people who had made the a crystallography experiment that was one of 200,000 experiments that went into protein data bank that ultimately caused this paradigm shift when AI came along and ate up all the data and solved that space that I think they're going to win the Nobel Prize for and they should win the Nobel Prize for. If I was one of those 200,000 research groups, I'd be like, do I get a shout out in that Nobel Prize? <laughs> is, there, is there some way of referencing that I did some of the core basic research? And I think that um, the uh, models will come up with a way to improve the provenance of the research data and there will be this flow full of, through of impact. But I don't think we're at a point now where it's putting people off because I don't think... Uh, I don't think people are aware to that level yet. Thank you. I see a few more questions coming in. I'll address this one that was uh, for you, Mark, and I may just stop typing on the other because I realize uh, that we only have three minutes left. But Joachim is asking whether you have looked at the connections between data sets and articles in the, in the opposite direction, essentially. How many you were reporting how many articles you can find and mention? To a data set, have you looked at the links? So how many data sets have links to a journal? No, uh, <laughs> very early. Maybe that uh, was a very quick Yeah, answer. it's very early. <laughs> the, the thing we're looking at next is, can you look at reuse, which is a lot of people say, this is my data set, here it is. And you can that as a link, which is a citation. But in reality, how many people which have different sets of authors completely have reused that data set? And that's the next thing we're looking at. But it's doable. The data set's open, you can go do it yourself. Good, thank you, Mark. Um, right, the next question from Madison, I think I, I may be able to say this more quickly than I can type, so I'll attend. 
Uh, the next question from Madison is about uh, metrics for data access for things that go beyond views and downloads. So, for example, there is a lot of data being produced these days, so streaming, you know, large files, etc. Um, I'm very glad that Madison asked this question. We don't have the answer necessarily, but the, we had a whole panel discussion about this at the summit because we recognize that a lot of the work that has been done around citations, views, that loads is about, oh, here is my files. I have a persistent identifier. Here are my beautiful package and now cite that and it's kind of the static uh, data set. And we recognize that there's a lot of research now being done in many disciplines that doesn't fit that type of uh, format necessarily. So we have started exploring this at the summit, but I would say that my answer to this is that we do need to start having more of the community conversations as to what are the touch points where we may be able to collect information, again, in consistent ways as to who is accessing these files in the cloud, to which level of granularity, because this will be very large files, for example. Um, so certainly something that we should, I guess, roll our sleeves up and keep working on because it's new measures of usage that we will need to uh, come back to. Uh, yes, so we only have one minute, minute left. There is one question that I'm going to try to answer very quickly from Sean Jung about the fact that there is sensitive data that is uh, in control access repositories. What about that? I would say you can have sensitive data that has open metadata and through the metadata we can collect information as to what is the use uh, and, for example, citations, etc. to those data sets. So, for example, as part of the gray Generalist Repository Initiative. Um, one of the participants is Bibli that actually has managed access for clinical trials data, and they're actively working on, on sharing that counts for views, downloads, et cetera. So I, I guess the important thing is keep working on persistent identifiers and open metadata. And with that, we can at least collect that view of the usage. Um, good, so thank you so much for the questions. Um, we are right on time, but I wanted to thank again, Mark, thank you for being here, for sharing all of the great analysis and the information that you're collecting. And I would like to echo your uh, key point of not letting perfect be the enemy of the good. I believe in that very much. We've made the great progress, much more to get done, uh, but I'm sure we will continue to improve. So thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, thank you to all the attendees um, for listening and for your questions. And yeah, I'm sure that we will have a chance to discuss most, more metrics in a future opportunity. So have a good rest of the day. Take care.